Welcome everyone, I'm Hector Rojos. I'm one of the coordinators of Materia and today we have a very special guest indeed. I won't be making the introductions of our guests and our very esteemed respondent. My colleagues uh, Lea Pau and Romina Weinberg will. Uh, what I do want to share uh, first off is a big, big thank you to Sibylle Kremer. Uh, she has been very gracious through the preparations of this event, which had uh, several avatars. Um, at one point, you may recall from our early advertising, this was going to be a joint event. After much deliberation, we've decided to split these events and we're going to see uh, our speakers have even more time to, um, to speak to us and for us to learn from them. So, Sibile, truly, I want to start with enormous appreciation about your kindness, your flexibility, it, from the heart. Mm -hmm. um, and then having said that, um, I want to share also for the benefit of those of you who may be joining us for the first time, a bit about how Materia has in recent times had a number of um, complementary uh, approaches. And uh, one uh, tendency that has emerged since Professor Lea Pao joined Materia a little while back is an interest in media studies in um, experimenting with um, the affordances of the analog and the digital, thinking back about uh, the history of information. And so when, um, as a group, we deliberated on the theme of the year, um, the idea of life and transmission emerged as something that has to do with media studies, the uh, history of information, and also with the post-anthropocentric um, approach that Materia has had previously that is a little more emphasized on objects, the non-human, to some extent the environmental, um, the new materialist and so forth, right? So, so we've been having these conversations for a while. Um, Sibile, uh, you were asking us before we started to, to record. Materia has been operating, I believe, since 2014. Um, Jimena and I have been involved since the get-go um, Marilia Librandi Roja, uh, who's presently at Princeton, was also part of the group at a moment. So was uh, Daniel Hernandez, Juan Esteban Plaza Parroquia, Patricia Valderrama, Patricia Valderrama Monica Van Bladel. These are uh, both, you know, faculty and, and, and student coordinators. So it's been really rewarding to see over the years that several generations of scholars have um, adopted Materia and, and it has been affirmed for their own uh, research uh, uh, proposals. There are, I mean, really uh, several dissertations, books and articles out there in the world connected to the discussions that we have in Materia. So, you know, that's, that's in a nutshell, um, some of the, of the lines of research in the group and a, and a tiny bit of the, of the longer history. Romina Weinberg has kept us you know, honest and organized for the last two years uh, through no small effort of, of her part through the pandemic. So anyways, I just want to welcome everyone to the virtual room and I'll pass it over to Lea and Romina for further introductions. Uh, hello everyone, um, uh, very happy to see you and I'm so excited um, that I will be able to introduce to you uh, Sibylle Kremer, uh, who uh, was uh, until her retirement uh, in April 2018 a professor of philosophy at the Freie Universität uh, Berlin. Since March she has been a professor at the uh, Leuphana University in Lüneburg um, at the Institute for Aesthetics and Culture of uh, digital media. Um, she has been uh, around quite a bit with uh, visiting professorships in Tokyo, Yale, uh, Vienna, um, Graz, Zürich, uh, Luzerne. Um, uh, and her field of research uh, includes uh, the theory of mind, uh, epistemology, philosophy of rationalism, uh, philosophy of language, writing and image, media philosophy, and theory of digitalization. So she's uh, uh, perfect uh, for our seri uh, series and also more on a more personal note. Um, I uh, have read a long time ago, I think shortly after it came out in German, uh, her book on media messenger uh, transmission and approach to media philosophy. And it's uh, in German, it was published in Suhrkamp and it's such a beautiful little book that has really um, had a huge impact on me. And, uh, I've been rereading it 
uh, many times since then, um, both for teaching and just for the pleasure of it, um, because it's uh, it's really it's such a fascinating um, uh, and really beautifully done book. So I encourage you you all to to have a look. Uh, it has been translated into English uh, uh, as. Um, like I said, media, media messenger transmission. Um, the German title is Medium Bote Übertragung. Uh, it has also, I believe, been translated into Japanese. Uh, so many of, of uh, Professor Kremer's writings have been translated in, in numerous languages, English, Hungarian, French, um, Japanese, and, and Chinese. Um, she's published uh, uh, a lot on uh, various topics. And her topic for today um, is, is truly something that uh, I think is, is very, very urgent um, in this moment, not just for my, my own uh, research and information and the history of information, but um, as we are thinking about media and the digital age and, uh, and now also have to rethink its history. I think it comes at really uh, at a long overdue uh, moment. So I'm, uh, I'm so happy and excited that we can welcome uh, Sibylle Kremer here today. Um, please join me. Uh, with a round, a round of virtual applause. Um, thank you very much. And we're also excited to have uh, Hank as a respondent, and I believe uh, Romy will do the brief introdu introduction of, of Hank. Thank you so much, Leon. Uh, yeah, Hank, thank you so much for being here. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Hank is a PhD candidate in Film and Media Studies at Stanford University's Art and Art History Department. His research concerns contemporary complexity sciences within the context of algorithmic governance, cybernetic history, and aesthetics. And I am um, slightly familiar with his work. I have read some of his work, and it's really amazing and mind-blowing. So I'm really, really happy, Hank, that you're here. Uh, so without further ado, Sibia also very personally at a personal level, huge fan of your work. So it's, it's such a pleasure and such an honor to be here. Sibylle, I think hey. the, floor, the floor is yours. Can I start? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, first of all, Hector thank, and the Materia group, thank you very much for this kind invitation. It's very fine to have you at my screen. <laughs> And it is a little bit a poor event, but we will do it. Uh, then, uh, Leah, Leah Pau, thank you very much for your introduction. I want to share the screen. And now we will do that. Wait a moment to have it. No, I, I want to have it. Uh, Okay, this is my cover, <laughs> let us proceed. Uh, I want to go uh, through my reflection in eight steps. The first, the performativity of operative writings. Second step, Ajvarizmi, transmitting the, transmitting the Hindu Arabic numerals to Europe. The third, technology, a theme feminism, the fourth, cultural technique of flattening, fifth, Ada Lovelace writing the first computer program, sixth, Grace Hopper inventing the first compiler, seven, Josephine Miles introducing the computer as a research tool within humanities, and finally, and last step, making explicit some scenes and a question underlying my talk. Okay, let us start. What does writing mean? In the Western tradition of alphabetic literacy, writing is mostly considered as a fixed oral language. It thus becomes a secondary medium that is related to spoken language as a primary system. This view, writing referring to speech, is called the phonographic dogma. 
The following considerations intend to decenter and overcome this dogma. Yet note the term phonographic dogma is not to be confused with Jacques Derrida's claim of a European phonocentrism. We can debate this later. My argument contra the phonographic view of writing is that there are spoken language independent scripts whose performative dimension is to produce what they represent in an operative and technical manner. These purely visual graphic notations have a double function. On the one hand, they are language and medium, and on the other, they are tools for operating with what is presented in the medium. Operative writings are symbolic artifacts that are able to function as technical instruments. I would like to explain the specific character of this technically effective script, together with the history of the discovery of operating, operative writing in four stages. You know already I'm going from Al Schwarzmi to Ada Lovelace to Grace Hopper and to Josephine Miles. It was often women who pioneered the history of operative writing. Incidentally, an intimate connection between mind, writing, and technology becomes a program in a technophile feminist movement. In Donna Haraway's idea of the Cyborg Manifesto in 1985, and 30 years later in the Xeno Feminist <laughs> Manifesto of the Female Collective. Laboria Kubovnitz. Now I'm coming to my second step to Al Schwarzmi. You can already look at him. If 826 is to be multiplied, multiplied by 692, we can perform this complex intellectual work as a mechanical procedure on paper. Numbers are invisible. No one has ever seen a number yet, but we visualize numbers with different sign systems. Yet with Roman numerals, written reckoning isn't possible. You need an abacus to calculate. But with the help of the Hindu Arabic decimal numerals, we can solve numerical problems by algorithmically manipulating and transforming series of written symbols. The rules of this procedure are independent, that's a relevant point, are independent of interpretation. To use the algorithms, we do not need to know, for example, the meaning of the sign for zero. Is zero a number at all? Can nothing? the not being of something be counted, but artifice of arithmetic represented in the decimal position system is that these inter interpretive questions are irrelevant for the efficiency of the operations. We can find correct solutions by manipulating signs without understanding and knowing what we are actually doing. When we learn the multiplication tables by heart, we practice arithmetic as a pure pattern transformation. To realize something without understanding its functioning is a principle of the use of technology. We can and we do act like a machine even within the realm of mental work. The stratagem of the operational Hindu Arabic numerals consists in its double life. It is a graphic language for representing numbers and at the same moment, a technical tool of number crunching. Algorithms are written artifacts 
forms of intervening textuality. Their performativity consists in the way that the writing down of an arithmetical problem simultaneously provides the instruments, the instrument for its solution. It was the Arab scholar al who transmitted the decimal number system invented by Indians, Indian mathematicians to Europe. A culture war broke out with the Christian church, which condemned the use of the zero. Only the conversion of bookkeeping from wrong numerals to the decimal numbering system in the European trading centers help written arithmetic to triumph. The Greek reckoning board, the Roman abacus, the South American knotted script kipu, were instruments of calculation that could only be used by a specially trained elite. With the written form of arithmetic, it became a cultural technique learned at school and used in everyday life. A popularization of elementary knowledge takes place. Elementary mathematics is no longer reserved for genius talents, but becomes an activity that can in principle be carried out by anyone who learns the science system and its algorithms. Algorithms are not bound to computers. Long before the digital computer we developed symbolic machines, the computer, so to say, within us, executed in the interplay of human hands, eyes, and signs. Our thinking is dependent on the materiality, exteriority, and corporality of the cognitive views of perceptible and manipulable signs. Human mental power requires not only social interaction, not only the physical experience of our situated embedding in an environment, but also the cultural technique of interaction with symbolic artifacts functioning as a kind of mind technology, so to say a mindless mind technology. Here, uh, a citation, as Alfred North Whitehead in 1911 stated, civilization progresses by expanding the number of important operations that can be carried out without thinking about them. The cultural technique of written numeracy is already based on an intimate fusion of humans, symbolism, and technology. Humans has, have always been posthumanists. Now, my third step, technology of feminism. Regarding this synthesis of humans, technology, and symbolism, I would like to recall a feminist movement with a deep affinity to technology, for technology. This technophile feminist movement starts with Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto and continues 30 years later with the Xenofeminist Manifesto of the collective Laboria Kubonics. Here is other pictures. <laughs> I like especially this uh, Herculean uh, gesture <laughs> of the woman on the, on the keyboard. Okay. But I want to give you first the citation of um, Nona Haraway. Technological determinism is only one of the ideological spaces opened by the Greek conceptualization of machines and organisms as coded texts, whereby we participate in the game of writing and reading the world. And here, <laughs> of Laboria Kubovnik, it's a 
collective, female collective of six women. If nature is unjust, we have to change nature. Okay. <laughs> Regardless of the differences in these manifestos, both texts unfold a posthumanist philosophy and privilege the technical as the nucleus of human being in the world. Women, women should not fear technology, but take hold of it. Women's creative use of technology is interpreted as a potential for female emancipation and the overcoming of gender-specific dualisms. In the evolution of the performativity of operative writing, women have inscribed themselves as pioneers of digital literacy. But before going to the female pioneers, the cultural technique of flattening needs to be explained. This is step four, cultural technique of flattening. We live in a three-dimensional world, yet we are surrounded by illustrated and inscribed surfaces, from cave paintings to skin tattoos, from pictures to writings, diagrams, maps, to computer screens, smartphones. The threat of flattening runs through the whole human cultural history. We are intellectually socialized into a rhetoric of depth. What is profound and has deepness is a noble. Reference to surfaces is depreciated. Superficiality is tabooed. But we have to reflect the technique of flattening out not as a loss, but a productive force. What the invention of the wheel was for the mobility and creativity in the physical era of the body, the invention of inscribed surfaces is for mobility and creativity in the mental area. But how strange! Also, operating with surfaces is almost ubiquitous. The role of two-dimensionality as a protective medium is hardly discussed. <laughs> the potential of artificial two-dimensionality remains a culturally unconscious. What is secret and artificial of the subterranean creativity of flattening? Physically, we are embedded in an environment that has three orthogonal, orthogonal, oh, that's different in English, orthogonal, okay, however, I do not know how to, how to pronounce it, orthogonal, okay. But you understand me, I hope so. Spatial axis. Up, down, right, left, front, back. Everything that lies in the back is withdrawn from perception and thus uncontrollable. Artificial flatness takes away depth and provides readers and observers with a bird's eye view. A unique space of complete survey and perfect control has come into being. Everything that is, that which is not yet, and even that which can never be, because it is an impossible object, can be projected into two-dimensionality and also can be processed on paper, something like this. Here you see the impossible objects. You know a lot of impossible objects, but here are two. A workshop for developing thoughts, a laboratory for technical and architectural designs, a playground for artistic creations has come into being. We have to think of the cultural technique of flattening not as a reduction, but as a creative and constructive power. By the way, 
the shadow is the natural protoform of a projection into two dimensionality. The origins of science and art are closely linked to the epistemic and aesthetic use of shadow. Only two examples. My first is the sundial spread all over ancient cultures. In the ancient sundial, with which time is measured, we can find, so to say, the beginning of science by beginning of measuring of time. And then I give you a, a well-known legend of Butades. In the legend of the potter, of the potter's daughter, Butades, told by Plinius the Elder, who fixes the departing lover as a graphic silhouette on the wall, we can find the beginning of pictorial arts. All forms of inscriptions that are created by engraving in or drawing on surfaces participate in the productivity of two-dimensionality. No, there is no empirical flatness. Yet we treat and it, yet we treat inscribed and illustrated surfaces as if they have no depth and backside. And this applies all the more to the operative scripts that initiate digitality. Women often play a pioneering role in computer history, understood as the history of digitalizing writing practices. Now my step five, Ada Lovelace. I have a picture. This was an edition on her I have edited some years ago. Ada Lovelace is the daughter of the poet Lord Byron and the aristocrat Annabella Milbank. Her parents separate eight weeks after her birth. As it Customary in aristocratic circles, Ada receives the best possible education taught by recognized scientists. <clears throat> Already as a growing girl, she tinkered with stream powered flying machines. She marries, has three children, and dies of cancer at the age of 36. As a woman, she has no access to libraries. Her husband copies by hand the books she needs. But she can visit and join London's aristocratic saloons, where she met the most famous scholars of her time. In 1843, nine years before her death, she created something that enters her name, the history of the computer. She created the first executable, so to say running, computer program. Charles Babbage, with whom Ada was in constant contact, designed an analytical engine, which is considered the archetype of the digital computer. Ada Lovelace recognized, as it was clear to Babbage, that this draft is a universal machine that can only be transformed into a special purpose directed machine by means of a program. She writes, this program to calculate the Bernoulli numbers, a mathematical series that has many applications. Her program has the form of a table. You see, this is the first written uh, computer program. The horizontal line from left to right represents the particular machine parts. The vertical line from top to bottom indicates the state after the execution of single operations. Lovelace uses programming techniques that are still common today. Conditional branches, operation loops, return systems. She recognizes that the analytical engine is not only capable of performing calculations, but can process everything that can be written down in the script of mathematics, whether that is algebra, weaving carpet patterns, or musical compositions. 
Typical of female writing is that she adds her program and the accompanying comments as an appendix to her English translation of a French essay on Charles Babbage. And she wants not to underestimate or overestimate this machine. The machine can only do citation, whatever we instruct it to perform. With Ada Lovelace computer program, hardware and software become distinguishable, distinguishable dimensions of the computer. Ada Lovelace's innovative power has been realized as an act of writing that is quite far removed from the forms of literary authorship. But programming is also a writing practice with a, with a performative power to technically shape the world. Two other female pioneers encounter this technical path, Grace Hopper and Josephine Miles. First to Grace Hopper, I have a picture too. Grace Hopper teaches mathematics at a college. She's active in the US Navy during World War II and in 1943. She had to program the first computer built entirely from electromechanical components. The name of this machine is Harvard Mark I. After the war, she takes over the management of a large software department. Her basic idea is that programming should be done in a language that is not too far from colloquial language and can be read by humans. Programming languages and techniques should not cut the intuitive rhythm of our understanding. Due to this idea, she invents the compiler she invents the compiler with which source code, this is on the left side, can be transferred or translated into machine code on the right side. Source codes are programs written by humans that describe completely what actions a machine has to execute. They are what is classically understood by a software document. Compilers take on the task of automatically translating these source texts into machine language, such as binary code. Compilers enable human written programs to be intuitively understandable and machine performable. While Ada Lovelace wrote the first software as source text, so to say, Grace Hopper wants to bridge the gap between software and hardware between human written programming language and machine understandable code. Throughout her life, Grace Hopper helped the US Navy with computer problems and therefore did not retire until she was 80. She received 40 honorary doctorates. And in 1969, she was awarded. This is fine, the Men of the Year Award by the Data Processing Management Association. That is really ridiculous, isn't it? That <laughs> you are the Men of the Year. In 1991, she was one of the first women to receive the US National Medal of Technology. Now, step seven, Josephine Miles. Here she is. Josephine Miles, who suffered from degenerative arthritis as a child and is confined to a wheelchair most of her time, is the first woman to hold a tenured professorship in literature at Berkeley. At the same time, she's a poet herself, thus combining art and science. A few years earlier than Roberto Busa, who is considered the classic pioneer of digital humanities in literature. She created a concordance to the texts of the poet John Dryden, using computers provided by the 
engineering laboratory at Berkeley University. A colleague who had prepared this concordance in the form of handwritten cards in a settling box died. Josephine Miles took over his project and immediately realizes that the mindless work of compiling a concordance to a corpus of literature could be usefully assigned to a machine. Already since the 13th century, the creation of concordances, registers, and indexes has been part of the routine work of humanity scholars. But she's the first to use a computer for doing that. She also applies quantifying methods in her literary studies research, which are discussed, you know it very well from Stanford today, under the term distant reading. The results of her quasi empirical work with literature are not continuous narrative texts, but take the form of lists and tables. Table once more again. Josephine Miles has difficulties finding publishers for these forms of textuality. Crucial, however, are her interpretations of her quantified results. With the help of counting word frequency in large text corpora, she is able to criticize and correct basic assumption of her assumptions of her discipline. For example, she refutes the usual opinion of a fundamental metaphoricity of poetic language in Romanticism and reveals this assumption as a protection of modernity onto the poetry of a bygone era. Or she shows how the prevailing stylistic analysis of the poet William Woodsworth are mistaken because they are based on a one-sided selection of a few poems while neglecting and ignoring a large number of his other poems. Josephine Miles is a pioneer of the digital humanities, both with a computer-generated concordance project and with her quantifying methods of literary studies. Her message is, Quantification does not replace interpretation, but the two intertwine. New results emerge where the methods of operative writing combine with literary hermeneutics. Josephine Miles became a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1964, and the Josephine Miles Literary Award was established in 19. 91, in honor of her commitment to the multicultural literature. Now I come into my last and very short step. Making explicit some of the themes underlying this talk, and finally, a little bit risky question. What is the theoretical sense and methodical message of the narratives developed here? Let me close with four abstract and tentative remarks. First, material exteriority matters. Intellect and intelligence is not localized in the mental interior world of human brains and heads. Cognition and reasoning is a socially and culturally shaped competence realized in the interactions of people with their symbolic and technical artifacts. Embodied mind not only means to have a body and to be situated in an environment, it means that our symbolic artifacts have a genuine physical materiality, being literally a corpus in the Roman sense of corpus as a Latin for a body, that is perceptible can spatially be ordered, this is very relevant, uh, relevant, and is thus processable. Second point, hybridity is a potential 
Operative writing emerges from the union of language and iconicity, as well as from the fusion between the symbolic and the technical. In our cultural history, as in our theories, language and image, symbolism and techniques are clearly differentiated. But something new emerges where distinguishable spheres or registers combine and produce something that finds no example or standard in any of the respective spheres. Operative writing has no model, neither in the linguistic nor in the pictorial. Third point, praxeology as method. What is technique, a thing, a script, an algorithm is, depends on how we deploy and use it. There is no essentialism, what it is to be language, a script, a medium. To look at things and situations from a praxeological view means to discover their ambivalences. For example, algorithms make procedures at the same time praxeologically transparent and cognitively opaque or intransparent. With deep learning techniques in artificial intelligence, black boxing, for example, becomes a serious problem. Fourth, translation matters. The female pioneers of the ditches they had to do trans to do with translation processes. Ada Lovelace translates an essay on Babbage and develops her own ideas and her computer program within her translation. Grace Hopper invents the compiler as a translator of programming language into machine code. Josephine Miles translates a literary oeuvre into a database. To translate is to act as a mediator between separate words. Is mediating between different sites a basic definition of axiological media philosophy? Friedrich Kittler is a proponent, I've worked with him for a lot of years, is a proponent of a machine deterministic media theory. My own media philosophy developed in the book Media Messenger Transmission uh, takes an alternative view which is Hitler's man opponent, so to say. The archetypical media functioning is not making and producing what is mediated, but connecting and communicating within heterogeneous words. And here comes my question. Does the media philosophy that primarily focuses not on generating and producing, fabricating, but on connecting and translating had a female dimension. This is my last sentence of my speech. Thank you very much for listening. And now I... Okay. Thank you very much, Sibylle, for that provocation. Um, I'll pass it over to Hank, but I have uh, lots of notes with questions and um, talking about material culture uh, and uh, and the written word, uh, I just happen to have this um, on my desk. You may recognize. <laughs> 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 and I was taking notes here absentmindedly thinking. Oh, the university iconic. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> the icon just spoke. Um, Hank, Hi. please. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was incredibly rich. Um, thank you so much. Um, for that talk. Uh, gosh, where to begin? I mean, I think one thing, the, your, your decision here to sort of pick out this line of, of women who, and this sort of feminine aspect to the history of computation, I think um, is something that's really important um, and something that's been sort of under, under theorized. Um, it reminds, when you were speaking, it, I was reminded of a sort of, uh, track in parallel is is the sort of history of weaving 
um, in its relation to computation, um, which uh, reaches this kind of fever pitch in my mind in the 60s for the Saturn V rocket, which is the rocket that goes to the moon. Um, the computer, it's, you know, it's a, an electronic computer that was put in that rocket um, is actually hand woven by a, a group of women. It's a series of um, copper wires with little steel rings and they literally wove every bit um, into this. Uh, it, you can look it up on Google. It's this, it looks like a piece of fabric. Um, so I wonder, I wonder one, one question is, I wonder if you have any thoughts on, um, on, on weaving the materiality of that as, as something that's um, intersecting with this um, idea of exteriorization where your um, the cognition and, and, and algorithmic processing is something that happens beyond the body. Um, I'm also fascinated by this, uh, the argument you ha have of the, this almost phenomenological argument, the three dimensionality of space and, and the importance of flattening um, where you take the you know, three dimensional, which is, um, I don't know what word to use. It's susceptible to, or it by nature has these behinds and these unders and these things, which in order to see them, you have to rotate around. And um, so the advantage of the two dimensional is that you have this um, sort of plane of nonlinear possibility um, onto which you can project these symbols. Um, I think that's that's fascinating. And it, I, so a, a second question is, um, you brought up at the very end opacity and, and black boxing as a big problem. It, it seems to me maybe that um, with computation, with miniaturization, um, you know, how, how many trillions of operations per second um, modern computers operate at, there, there's kind of, it seems to me, maybe an inversion in which um, there's a, a kind of temporal behind now where there's this sort of phenomenological inability to see around computation in a temporal way rather than a spatial way, maybe. And, and that, that's in some ways irresolvable because you know, human perception and cognition simply can't approach those kinds of um, speeds. So I wonder what you think about that. Um, maybe I'll stop there, just um, those two questions out. Um, but thank you so much for this talk and I'm really looking forward to um, this discussion. Shall I answer now to Hank? That's the program. Okay, I, I will do that. Thank you very much, Hank. Uh, and beginning with the, with the last, you know, it's, it's late. I have to, to train my memory to, to be uh, on the table now. No, no. Okay, uh, this is what about time? Uh, when I have worked on the diagrams, speciality was what matters for me. And I was always have this very, this very um, uh, few only looking for, for, for spatial ordering and so on and so on and neglecting what is the function of time. But I know that the secret is the interaction of uh, time and space. Now, um, as an example, when I'm speaking, it is in a temporal sequence. When I'm writing down, it is a spatial sequence. And there is always this interaction. I can uh, perform the musical notation, the partiture, in a musical performance, time is, uh, in, is translated in space and space is translated in time. That is always happening and this is the secret of all this stuff. The, uh, the flatness is a medium in between the one, I say so, it's not the whole story, the one dimensionality of time and the three dimensionality of our living space. And therefore it is in between the two, and therefore it is something like a translational manual, uh, always, uh, always bringing one side to the other and, and vice versa. Therefore, well, that's set in the first stage. But now to the digital computer, because this is a very relevant question, uh, I have 
reconstructed even digitality in terms of um, flatness, of the cultural technique on flatness. And I think looking at the modern uh, computer, so to say, at deep learning techniques, for example, not at programming uh, techniques, but at this kind of autonomous, they are not autonomous, but I, it's ideologically, but I uh, take this name, proper name, the autonomous um, machines. But if you are going back to the deep learning uh, technique, you can, um, you can observe two different phenomena. The first is there are hidden layers. What is the hidden layers? I have lots of diagrams. If it is shown in the informatics, you are always seeing flat, uh, what is surfaces behind surface, behind surface, behind surface. It is as with the 3D uh, printer, uh, putting volume by, <laughs> by, by, uh, uh, stapeln, I, I'm missing the word, by putting a surface over the next and the next and the next. And therefore, I think in a special, but only in a special way, flatness comes back, but inside the machine, not outside. And this is the problem because the machine has to be trained by data and we do not know what is the model the machine uh, extracts out of the millions of data. There is a big problem with the, because the data, deep learning machines are using too much data. A child is learning the, the difference between a cat and a dog with four examples. Then a child knows what is a cat and a dog normally. But a machine needs a, a million, two million, two, two million pictures to get this competence. And I think the resource problem is a real problem of artificial intelligence. Normally we think the data universe is infinite, but that's wrong. And, but this was not the question. Back to, to time. On the one side, flatness again, hidden layers. But on the other side, think of a very uh, modern technique of Google, a timetable. I have, uh, I, I have not, analyzed it up till now. But I have the impression that in the newest technique of search machines, time is coming back as a third dimension. And I have some texts of engineers uh, constructing these uh, kind of uh, new search engines uh, working with Google that they speak about bringing time back as a third dimension. And they are speaking of rows and columns. And now the time comes in and is the third and time. And this means that a search um, engine, an algorithm, <laughs> the engine, the algorithm has not to look for all the pages, but only uh, in every second, a million new pages are arriving the internet and the web and, and the machine has only to look for the newest ones and can neglect the elder one. And this is uh, the secret of this kind. But only this as an answer. Yes, it is absolutely relevant what happens with time and the newest uh, storage techniques uh, work with us. And the time stamp every date in uh, every, um, every config data configuration has a time stamp. We know it. Uh, therefore, time matters. That would be my message, my answer. Time matters. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that, no, that's, that's great. Um, Romina, what should what should I ask another question or do you ah, the, the the texture, the weaving. Oh uh, yeah, of course. Your first. Yes, uh, surely think about the the term texture. It is from weaving, and. For me, it is very interesting to, to reflect on the creativity of the um, cultural technique of flattening is reflecting what can you do by point, line, and surface. By this try and connect it. And whatever you can do with these try instant uh, entities uh, will be the productivity of a surface. But the line has a special has a special role because you can go back ting ingold the anthropologist has done that you can bring back the life the epistemic so to say life 
of the diagrammatical line by going back to uh, sticks and to ropes. Uh, ropes, I hope this is the, 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 oh, the words are missing, but you know it, this is uh, like a circle or whatever you are weaving, whatever you are doing, that is the rope and, and the stick. And these two conceptions of a line, what you can do with the line to have it in a rigid way as a measurement, no, as a measure stick, or to have it uh, for uh, as a soft soft device. Uh, this is very interesting, and even in the mathematical not theory, not theory, Knoten theory. I think I do not know if this is the correct term, but even in math, the modern mathematics of not not theory, um, it is relevant that you have this kind of different possibilities what to do with the line, the round thing, so to say the curve and the rigid axis. No? And therefore I think, uh, but back to the weaving, uh, we all know that uh, the weaving is, is the, the beginning of textuality, so to say of textuality, even, yes, yes. In making a surface, no? the surface in production no? by, by crossing. Uh, the ropes. Exactly, yeah. Threads. Yeah. No, now I have found the word thread. <laughs> <laughs> Not rope, thread <laughs> would be better. <laughs> see, see, Billy, if I may jump in, and, and I want to tell folks who uh, have class right now, as, as you know, we're, we're in the middle of the day, if, if anyone needs to, to leave uh, to teach or take class, uh, feel free to do so. We're going to maybe uh, converse for another few minutes. Um, and, and I had a, a, a question, Sibylle. Um, I was very taken, and I am also in reading your work, by your alternative take on deterministic media theory. I think that, you know, determinism and technology is the lingo of the day. It's, it's very worrisome. Uh, there's, there's such a strong, like, backdoor historical theology there. Uh, that's very persuasive, and you give us, um, I, I don't even want to use the word instrument, but I'll use it. You give us instruments, you know, for thought here. Um, I also appreciate very much how there is uh, a dimension of aesthetic appreciation and just, you know, uh, uh, thick descriptive power. When you describe the uh, sun clocks, as epistemic creative shadows, you know, the, the mind just reels. It, it, is, it is very precise, um, but you also situate yourself outside of a techno-social arrangement to be able to describe these things with such clarity. Um, so, you know, that's, that's just some reactions, but I do have a question that connects also to black boxing that Hank was, was pointing out. Um, and, and this is a little bit, you know, at odds with, the point I was making earlier about resisting teleologies, but do you feel that, you know, the black boxing of commercial grade algorithms in AI and otherwise too shall pass? And I ask this because some of the examples that you were showing us were um, inaccessible, uncomprehensible, but you also trace a process of democratization of algorithmic thinking, right? Uh, of, of increased uh, understanding, like e even for, you know, the humanists among us who are really not so great with numbers, we, we could follow. Um, do you think there's gonna be a horizon where this um, contingency of black boxing will disappear or is that too optimistic? <laughs> I think black boxing will never disappear because I think to be human means to be on one dimension a technological entity. To use technology is to be a human. But if it is like this, that technology is part of our nature, so to say, then the founding law, also it's a little bit emphatic, but the founding law of technology is to do something without understanding. I can use and drive my car 
without being able to understand what is happening that all this uh, uh, is running. And I think this, this is a principle that belongs in the inner core of what it is to be a techniques, to do something as Whitehead has stated is, to do something without reflecting on it. And normally we know about this in our everyday life. We don't, uh, we don't uh, understand our machines <laughs> at home normally, but it is introduced into our intellectual life too, to do something without interpreting and reflecting. And I try to show it in the everyday uh, technique of, uh, of written reckoning, of written calculation already. We do something very efficiently, but we don't know how it works. We normally don't know how is the, the, the algorithm of division, how is it able to, to do it like this? Normally we have not to know it, and even we do not know what is a number. We can forget all these theoretical questions this intellectual question. This is the secret, but this is at the same time the danger. And going back to black boxing, we know that the algorithms have to be trained and we know that in our practices, discrimination is embodied and instantiated. And if a machine is learned by these practices, no wonder that the machine reproduces biases and discrimination procedures and so on and so on. But on the other side, it is a step to get in con to be consciousness of what is happening, because it is already disputed in literature that the algorithms discriminate. But well, algorithms discriminate as we do in our practices. And the machine only can reproduce uh, what she, so to say, or he or it experiences in reality, in the human re in the social reality. Therefore, it can be because machines are making something explicit. What is implicit in our procedures, sometimes it can be a tool for insight, for um, research, for inquiry. Absolutely. Yes. And, you know, there's something so important in what you're saying, which is um, the realization that transparency, right, belongs to a dialectics. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's so often invoked as like the bedrock of truth. Uh, and uh, that's... <laughs> yeah. uh, this dialectic of transparency and intransparency, we will never get away. I think it is, it's an illusion. We need it because otherwise uh, we go crazy because <laughs> it is all too much. Uh, think about the zero. You will never come to an end in reflecting what it means to have an empty set, as George Bull later on stated, and this was the explanation for the zero. And, uh, but what does that mean? And I think these routines in to, to execute, I consciously use this term, to execute mind in a mindless way, is a kind of routine making life easier and making life more creative and effective because you have this kind of schematic operation that is operativity doing something once more again without understanding how it functions yeah yeah i, I just want to add um uh, I mean, th thank you. This is uh, this is. Um, I'm sitting here being very excited, um, but I want to add that this is true. I think n not just for technology, but for. I mean, I think routine is a really useful term to use here, but also just human practice. And it, to me, it, it just shows um, that it's not not just when we talk about you know, computers or algorithms that we need to to approach them as human practices, but we see the same things reflected in. Um, what people may think of as humanist things, like even with language, we use language even though we don't know um, uh, exactly how it works, or we use idioms we don't know where they come from. So, in all sorts of ways, it is really embedded in 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 a lot of our practices, but also things like love um, or friendship. Like we engage as humans in in social and cultural 
practices that we don't necessarily understand uh, or completely understand uh, all the time. So um, I think that's, uh, that's always good to remember that it's not just a numbers versus feelings thing where humans don't understand numbers, but they understand feelings. But no, I mean, I think this is just part, like this is really fundamentally human routine and, and human practice, which is why to me it makes so much sense to, to uh, approach technology from, and I've often outed myself in this group as a humanist, but from a humanist um, uh, perspective. Um, and in the same way, I think that's why anthropological and historical approaches are so important because we need to, we can always learn at new moments in history uh, more about different objects and why they existed and what the layers um, since Sibylla talked so beautifully about, about layers and surfaces and, and what transmission, uh, what uh, information they may transmit that they were, didn't intend to transmit. So that's also a kind of anthropological or historical approach. Um. Leah, thank you very much. I think this is absolutely relevant what you told. Even in language, normal, there is, so to say, an absolutism of interpretation and understanding. For me, I'm working on the digital humanities, but not because I think digital humanities has, are the humanities of the future, but they are one dimension, the empirical quantifying um, methodology and so on and so on, useful in some respects and not useful in a lot of other respects. But uh, I need in the humanities, with my colleagues, with the normal colleagues, so to say. They are absolute in confrontation because um, they, they cannot understand that hermeneutics is not the whole story of, of uh, the humanities, that the scholars in humanities are doing a lot more of work than only to interpret pictures and texts and music. And uh, therefore, I think to, to de, uh, oh, I, uh, once more again, the word is missing, to, to, ne uh, to, to put a little bit away interpretation and to see that especially language is functioning uh, of, of all, what means of all. Also, we do not have the same meaning with the words we use. We have different meaning, we know this, but we can cooperate, we can communicate, we can interact, because it does not depend on shared meaning. And this is a very interesting thing in language theory, that language functions without shared meaning. And I think, as you have shown, even in a lot of other regions of our life, is the same the schema, so to say, doing something, but not because we really understand. And even um, our relation to other persons, it may be that uh, the possibility to understand the other is, is a very reduced possibility in humans. And, uh, but we can interact without really, really understanding the other as a whole person, I think. I thank you so much. We, we are mindful that it is past 10 p.m. in Berlin. <laughs> so what I'd like to suggest is we take uh, two more questions. I am going to paraphrase the question uh, we have on the chat. And someone else, please uh, uh, be prepared for the last question of, of the evening mm -hmm. or the afternoon. This is a question from Leonardo Lama, who joined us from Brazil, and, and we're happy that you're with us. Um, and I'm going to um, underscore one aspect of this question, which is uh, your thoughts, uh, Sibylle, on the Kiplerian uh, figure of the secretary, right? Uh, who is not just a writable surface, but also a trickster, right? Um, so it's, it's a really interesting question. If, in case you want to read it, it's on the chat. I'm just highlighting a, a couple of elements there. Uh, you are muted, civil. Sorry. Yes, it is a very long question. Have I to read it now? Uh, well, 
I, if if you'd like to uh, yeah big but pen I, of your work Sibylle that's fine <laughs> <laughs> sorry but but um remembering women who are uh, sacred the role of women and secretaries in Hitler's work yes. not only as the void of agency and as writable surface but also as tricksters tricksters who disrupt the many world of discourse who loved and okay as Hitler described them I wonder if you dismiss this approach of a woman or if you see relationship oh I no I cannot really answer yes I'm, I'm um, I cannot read yeah. thank you very much for this question it's an interesting question um, but I cannot say anything about the secretaries of Hitler. Hmm. I know some students of him and uh, even female students and doctoral students, but not the secretary. I was not so uh, in team with him that I really know his whole uh, life at university. But uh, the, the interesting question is about my opposition to this determinism. Uh, my opposition is deeper. Uh, I have to, to describe it like that. In God has been the creator in the Christian tradition. And then modernity arises. And these attributes, the, crea the creative attributes of God uh, went to people. And now the human subject is the author, the creator is the producer of his world and him or herself. And I think that media theory in the last century begins with the idea that this creative power after the death of the subject, so to say, with Nietzsche and Foucault, the power, the creative, the producing power of the subject is going to the media. Now the media are the apparatus to generate world and so on and so on. And within this, um, this line of thinking, you find the preference for the process of producing, fabricating the man as homo faber, homo faber, the Latin word. And I think that this uh, idea, this model, man being a homo faber is a very reduced model. You, uh, we are, the messenger for me is not the opposite, but a complementary uh, view on people, uh, connect people and things, you know, communicate, mediate between heterogeneous words and so on. And therefore I think men as generator and men or human being as messenger are two complementary models for looking at the human existence. And once more again, this is not an alternative, but only together are these two types of being in the world functioning. And my question is, if this is a more a female side, so to say, to connecting, communicating, mediating, and that the <laughs> Hitlerian determinism is more on the male side of producing. But surely uh, we, the female does not substitute the producing stance, but the producing and the sending and connecting stance is relevant. Both are relevant and complementary once more again. Sibylle, thank you so much. You have given us so much to think about. Uh, we shall return to your work. And I think that for this evening, um, uh, I'm going to ask everyone to join me in thanking you. And uh, thank you very, very much. <laughs> Thank you, Sibylle, so much. Yeah. Uh, Robbie, you can hit the pause recording button.
for me, it was really a, a very good questions. Really, I, I have to, to tell you this. It, it was inspiring for me too. And I got some ideas going beyond uh, what I have uh, read in my paper. My only problem is my language in English. I have ever been bad in, bad in languages, better in mathematics. Ah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not so very good. But uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much, Hector and all the others, Romina and Leah. Thank you. We look and forward now I'm going away. Sounds great. We we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you in California. Have yeah. a good evening. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.